of... Oh, you keep it going. <laughs> flag Fen. Oh, yeah. We're doing the archaeology Flag Fen. Now, the... Flag Fen. F-E-N. Flag. Flag Fen. Flag Fen. Do you know any woman called Ivy? So I always call them Ivy. So they get very upset with that. I thought I'd put that in there. Well, right. If somebody has called them your grandchild. I mean, they have parents that have Ivy. I would like to work. I would like to say that the important discovery I made this week was that the name Pike is actually a real name. The name what? Pike. Pike. It's a Christian name, or is it's a Christian name? name yeah, because I was in the museum yesterday, right, with, with my daughter for the first time in a year. Um, and um, I, I was with her in the museum. I, I was looking over, and there was the Pike Thomas Gallery. And I thought, when when in um, uh, God Dad's arm, he says, "Oh, don't tell him Pike." I thought it was a made-up name. It's not. It's a real name. I just p- point the story yeah, away this back. Case, Pike was his surname. Was it? Yeah. 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 No, it's actually. Oh right, I but it's the full name. In Dad's arm, it was. It was Pike surname. Thomas. Yeah. Oh, it was the surname. Oh, Wilson. 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 Don't tell him Pike Fraser. You know, he's Wilson. Being is a stamp. Right, so we're doing the archaeology of Flag Fen. Now, Flag Fen, who has actually been to Flag Fen in the, in the room? Kathy. Nope, she hasn't. She wants me to go there when we go on a trip to Colchester. And I have been thinking hard about the trip, trip to Colchester. We might take my car after all, if a couple of you just want to uh, toss away with me and visit one or two of the sites on the, on the coastline. But we'll have a chat about that again. Um, so we're doing the archaeology of Flag Fen. Flag Fen itself, um, like all the sites that we've looked at, has an archaeologist in the driving seat, right? Um, and it would be would be very useful as we're doing these types of sites, even though it's not an ongoing um, excavation, to look at the tomb of the eagles, which was which was done by a father and a daughter team. But that's a, another lecture altogether. Flag Fen itself um, is is a, is a site um, yeah. that has told us um, a great deal. Not just about the um, Iron Age, but the Bronze Age as well. It's told us a great deal about how the landscape has changed, um, and it it also um, tells us a great deal on how to do reconstructions properly and how to do uh, how reconstructions can go quite awry. Now, I've spent a lot of effort in um, in this lecture looking at um, how you, you can get things wrong and right in archaeology. Um, Flag Fen is a site that's, um, that was found for the first time ever in 1982, and it's found by accident. Now, we're going to come into all the, na- the, the names of the archaeologists and everything who, who have been excavating at Flag Fen for some years, but he was an archaeologist who used to be seen quite often in Trinity, um, and he's still involved with the project. So where exactly is Flag Fen? I'm sure we will work that one out in a minute, Ellen, before she pipes up and says, where is Flag Fen? Okay. So Flag Fen really starts to come into its own. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a bit of sort of an environmental look at this as well. So Flag Fen is um, in East Anglia. Um, it's, it's east of Peterborough. It's very near Must Farm, so that sort of paints the picture. So you can imagine that that landscape is extremely boggy um, and is prone to, um, prone to if you've got floods, would be an area that's going to be hit quite dramatically. Now, looking at that landscape, when we think about 6,500 years ago, the Neolithic period, Flag Fen itself, the Flag Fen Basin, the idea of the Fen, we, we can understand what that <coughs> is, a Fen sort of boggy-like landscape with reeds. The Flag Fen Basin itself wasn't a boggy-like landscape with reeds back 6,500 years ago. It was a very different landscape then. It was a landscape that hadn't been affected by the mass flooding of Doggerland yet. Doggerland uh, is being flooded at this point, but East Anglia has survived the flooding. Um, now, what's coming on, um, coming about 4,000 years ago, the landscape is changing quite dramatically. And the landscape is changing quite dramatically at Flag Fen because all those upland areas 
um, which, which are in a little bit of a distance away, have been extensively farmed, and all the rich nutrients and everything are all, are all heading their way into the valleys and silting them up, and people are now moving down into those valley bottoms to actually be directly involved um, in the new, um, the new trend, which is um, excessive agriculture. And when we say excessive agriculture, it's an intense agriculture. Um, and the Bronze Age is where we get intenseness <coughs> of agriculture, and not just animal husbandry. But it's in the Bronze Age as well, which we can look back as a moment in our history, as being a point in time that human beings completely destroyed the British landscape. And it's happening now again. So history repeating itself, what we mean is that um, agriculture was so intense that those upland areas that once had trees and were rich in wildlife, those boggy, horrific landscapes of upland Wales and Cumbria and Scotland, that have, trees have never, ever returned. You can blame the Bronze Age people for that effect. And we can look back, maybe... Um, uh, hopefully David Attenborough's not right, but if David Attenborough is right, we'll look back at the last 30 years and say um, that we as human beings are completely destroying the planet. But it's not one of those lectures today. But we need to look at history and archaeology as indicators to understand how we're affecting the planet in whatever way you wish to see that. And sometime um, in the late Bronze Age, um, going into the Iron Age, um, the <coughs> landscape starts to be excessively flooded. Uh, there's flooding of the landscape. There's inundation of the landscape on a large scale. And our ancestors are having to deal with that sometime in the Bronze Age, in the Iron Age. But the effects are that those upland areas and all those areas that have been extensively farmed, agriculture, all that stuff is silting up those fens, um, and it becomes a boggy mire. And then in the Roman periods, period, um, coming into just after the birth of Christ, the Roman period, we see the Roman building dikes and drainage systems to drain the landscape, to get away that, away that boggy effect, that marshy effect. The landscape becomes a landscape that you can extensively farm and plough, and unknown to the Romans that there was once a rich Bronze Age and Iron Age landscape under the surface, and we'll talk a lot more about that. And then we go into the um, period of the Saxons, the Anglo-Saxons, the 500 um, AD, so 1,500 years ago. And what happens then is the Romans don't maintain those, those banks and dikes. There's climatic changes and the fens become flooded. And it's only in the past 100 years that we're able to retap those fens and to actually use them extensively as an agricultural resource. But agricultural resources ain't that good for archaeology because it destroys the archaeology but we'll come on to that in a short while. So what we need to do, we need to show, um, wait, wait a minute, I'm just gonna check something with it. Um, and do you know what? I, 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 I occasionally have long moments where I've been teaching this all week and um, I have completely forgotten the name of the archeologist excavating the site. He's a tubby one, isn't he? Yes! Francis Pryor, thank you. Oh, do, 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 do you know what? Do you know what? No. Right? I, I know, Kathy, you say no. that it, it comes to all of us growing old, but. No. Wait, you know, see, I didn't know. I couldn't remember his name. I exactly, you know what I mean? <laughs> I, I, I told you there was a link between me and Kathy. Francis Pryor, so what we're going to do, we're going to look at um, the, the locality just for. Move a few slides forward. All, all, most people don't insist on this, they expect me to do the lecture and then. Tell, tell them where the site is. So there we go. We've got East Anglia. And what we do have, we've got Peterborough here. And that dot there is where Flag Fen is. Not far away from Peterborough at all. And it's very near the Musk Farm excavations. The Musk Farm excavations, wonderful excavations. Not so long ago, just a couple of years ago, we, we, we were excavating at Musk Farm. We found a perfectly well-preserved Bronze Age village from 3,000 years ago. Um, and it's the likes of that Bronze Age village that I, is intriguing to me. You know, the Bronze Age village has re, re, made us re-understand um, how Bronze Age buildings were actually constructed. Up until that point, uh, we were tossing around in our minds and we just couldn't really work out how these Bronze Age villages were constructed. And we're learning a lot from us, fam. But more of that in a short while. 
I'd like to take us to why we're doing this project today, why, why we're doing this site. Not massive archaeological excavations going on there at present, it's occasional. Um, the archaeologists, uh, Francis Pryor, their expertise is used um, when there, there are projects to, to um, sort of um, deal with the uh, clogging up of the reens. Um, they've got a new dikes being constructed, which is obviously causing damage to the archaeology under the surface, which is very close to, um, um, to the topsoil. Um, there are projects going on there, of, um, various developments and so on. So our archaeology is still taking place within that landscape. And one thing that we find at Must Farm is this canoe, or if you want to um, get Americanized, you can call it a kayak. And we won't talk about the, the meanings for that at all. We've had that debate already. But this wonderful wooden, wooden built canoe itself um, was an extremely stable vessel in the past. You could go along those marshes, you could use these within those landscapes that are getting flooded, like Somerset, like the Somerset levels. You could use them to go across the Solent um, from the mainland to the Isle of Wight. You could use them definitely within the landscape of Star Car that we'll be looking at in a couple of weeks' time. Um, and you can use them within the landscape of Flag Fen. And we have found examples of these within the landscape at Flag Fen, within um, the Must Farm excavations very, very recently. Two examples of these, of these vessels, we'll call them. Not the type of vessels that you're used to, Goff, but I'm sure they're coming very handy. Um, the two of these have been exca excavated at Must Farm, they've been put on display at Flag Fen. There are calls for me to do a visit to Flag Fen. Uh, but that's not going to be any time soon. Oh, and by the way, your questionnaires will make me announce next week where next year's um, trip is going to be. Uh, there's, always a, there's already a heads up on where it's going to be, but your questionnaires are going to be vital in determining that. So this itself, why is it stable? Well, why it's so stable is we're going to look at little children. Here, there we go. Now you can imagine putting little children in and they're going to rock it back and forth, it's going to fall over. It just doesn't. Doesn't. This is a really stable vessel. So they plonked all these children in there. Um, and it's, it's really stable. Children are the best judge of whether something is stable or not. These are really fidgety little children. And they wouldn't dump these children in there. Okay, and it's not nailed down. They wouldn't dump these children in there if it wasn't stable. So it proves how stable these vessels were in the past. It doesn't look stable, does it? But it definitely is. Um, and this is what reconstruction archaeology is about. You look at these things and they look really flimsy. And, and the, amount, the amount of timber that you allow to be placed, uh, uh, um, placed in the keel itself, if you want to use um, nautical terms, if you, if you really sort of use that as the ballast, um, then that's going to give stability to the vessel. And this is what we're seeing with these children. So experimental archaeology, chuck a load of children and if it works, it's fine. I don't think you'd get away with them in a coracle, to be honest with you. you can you have a go? I'm sure they'd all drown, which wouldn't be very nice. So, Flag Fen. Um, so, here we go. Flag Fen itself, Francis Pryor. If I keep remembering Francis Pryor, I won't forget his name. Will I? So, Francis Pryor, when he, when he originally found the archaeology at Flag, um, Flag Fen itself in 1982, it was by complete accident. Um, I don't, know, I don't know if he was barefooted in the bottom of a ditch, right? but he stumbled over a post in a ditch that they, that they were, were desilting. And sticking out of that ditch was a post. Not any old post, okay? Um, it was a post dating back a few years, thousands of years. And in that moment, he stumbled across. Actually, he stumbled across, uh, nearly breaking his neck, um, the, the landscape of Flag Fen. I like Francis Pryor because lots of what he does say I actually agree with. Um, he's in the school of people who do not like um, um, the teachings of um, the wonderful archaeologist Mike Parker Pearson. Ooh. Exactly, yes. <coughs> Me and Francis Pryor on that page, right? With the wonderful Mark Horton and you've got the likes of uh, George Nash and you've got the likes of um, 
uh, my pad appears on this side, and you can't um, criticise Bethany Hughes. Um, everything she says is right. You know. Why did I go on a tangent like that? Be just to keep you happy. Mm -hmm. Flag Fen, Visitor Centre, uh, Reconstruction Buildings in the Iron Age, Bronze Age. And we have a Scratch and Sniff coming up as well. Actually, I really criticise the reconstructions of the buildings at Flag Fen and the, the rights and where for alls of, um, of how you should build a building in, in relation to what they discovered at Must Fire. But that is something that I'm sure um, uh, John will be really intrigued with. Won't it, John? Good. Um, I've got a, I've got a check to um, something in my diary here. John gets very upset if I don't mention his name at least twice in the lecture. That's it, man. I'm not going to mention you at all. So um, what we've got, we've got two reconstruction buildings um, um, which, which really stand out. There's another one tucked in there. So the, the, those are the Bronze Age ones. The, the Bronze Age ones with a nice green sort of turf roof seem to be better built than the Iron Age one, right? Um, so what we've got here, the sweet track going through there, not the sweet track, the, um, the trackway itself, uh, the, the very ancient trackway, it's truly ancient. The trackway was being laid down when the Uffington horse was being scoured for the first time. So we're talking about over 3,300 years ago, so great. So the trackway itself, um, which we now think is probably about a kilometre in length, going across the fen-like landscape, that's what's left of the fens there, so the boggy, marshy landscape. So it's about a kilometre in length, sort of hits this northerly, um, northerly little island here, goes all the way across, keeps going, and there's different interpretations. The one thing, the reason why I like Francis Pryor, getting back to that point again, is that he admits he's made mistakes in his interpretation of the archaeology, and that's a good archaeologist. Somebody who admits they're wrong, okay? Um, what else have we got? Minister Centre, we've got... Um, I'm. I need to go back to my plan, but I think of this one where they've got timbers which are being um, dried out <coughs> ready for another display, uh, which links us in with what you can see, see in that building, which is decaying timber, which they occasionally um, sort of spray and so on. But they've got so much of the trackway that um, when this one has really decayed and so on, they, they can bring the other one that they've really conserved and put it in position, and um, that's going to be another experience. But more about that in a few years' time. Um, and again, we, we've got sort of a little bit of a museum here as well. So we've got this nice sort of archaeological park, living history and all the rest going on, and this is, this is the resource that's been used. Now, um, quote, from, <coughs> quote from Monday, the past is not about one moment in time, but multiple experiences. Um, my direct quote. And that itself... Uh, is what we're talking about here. So I'm going to read that out again. Uh, the past is not about uh, one moment in time, but multiple experience or experiences. Um, and when, when, we, when we think about that, we're, we're looking at not a moment in time, but multiple moments in time. Uh, it's, it's very rare in archaeology that you get a, mul a, a single moment in time preserved in archaeology. You look at the likes of Pompeii, 24th of August, AD 79, 12 o'clock to 2 o'clock, the landscape of Pompeii completely changed, can't deny that. But within Pompeii there are multiple experiences on show. There's the experience of somebody suffocating to death, when in fact a, a few moments later there's a thick layer of pumice on top and then somebody else is, is choking to death on top of them. And then there's another thick layer and you've got a dead horse on top of that. That's not one experience. That's three experiences, four experiences, five experiences. And the past is always to seem to be seen not as one single moment. This is why history and archaeology can be so downright boring when people say X, Y, and Z, right? X, Y, A, X, Y, B, X, Y, C. It's so complicated. And that's, in a way, what makes history really interesting. And I think I've finally worked out. You know when we were all in school... Uh, which, which wasn't a long time... Chuck, go away. Um, when, we were, when we were all in school, um, I'm sure our history teachers either made history really interesting or really boring. And the ones who made it really, really boring were probably those history teachers who said, this is what's happening, and doesn't elaborate. 
basically, you've got the doomsday book, um, X, Y, and Z, and that's it. You could have had history teachers that said doomsday book, and actually people got killed. Doomsday book, um, um, this happened. Doomsday book, they only recorded this. You know, all those little bits of detail, multiple details, all these little things chucked in. Doomsday book helped us to understand this later on. Doomsday book was about Anglo-Saxon villages, normal, but Norman villages, and all the rest of it. That's when history gets really interesting. And this image itself uh, show, shows, shows a multiple sense of the past, very complicated sense of the past. The, so you've obviously got these timbers here have been sampled, okay? So they've been, they've been cut through by the archaeologists. So then you're left with all the other bits and bobs, all the little bits of brushwood. You've got um, aspen there, you've got um, the like of birch, you've got little probably bits of ash, oak, and all the rest of it, all tossed in there, right? to create some kind of a floor there, to create some kind of a floor for these buildings. There's also collapsed bits of wattle structures in there. There's bits of daub in there. Uh, there's bits of human hair in there. There's bits of animal dung in there. It's all mixed up. It's all complicated. So this is not one moment in time. When the building collapsed, uh, that was one moment. And when it all decayed, that was one moment. And when somebody trampled across it, that was one moment. And when it was disturbed, another moment is the archaeologists cutting these timbers to get samples through. So the past is extremely complicated, but that makes it really, really interesting. Um, it's not just one image. Do you know, do you know what? Right. Um, I don't know if any of you have been... Um, I, for the first time, I, I went into... Um, I went upstairs in the museum on uh, Wednesday, yesterday. And uh, I remember going in. When you go into the main, when you go into the main door of the of the museum, right? Main main door of the museum is the art galleries on this side, which everyone goes into, and the art galleries on this side, in the top floor on the right. I've never been in my life, right? So when I, I went all the way, I went all the way back into um, the back of this art of this gallery, and there, there was a wonderful picture in there. It was it was described as. Um, a piece of art produced in London in 1750, and it was entitled Celebrating St. David's Day, right? And it had a guy in a really weird, well, um, weird, strange hat. Um, and um, and in, in the corner of the, the image, there, there was a candle and there was a glass, right? And I had to take my glasses off. I thought somebody had actually stuck a photograph in, in this painting. It was the glass itself with the bubbles Right, and the water and the, the way the light was shimmering on the glass, it was so amazing. I would just take somebody just to see this one, one piece of art, right? Um, and the point I'm trying to make here is that you can't take a photograph of that painting. You would never be able to reproduce what I'm seeing, <coughs> right? And the point is, nobody can ever reproduce what you're seeing there, what's in your mind's eye, what actually happened. That's really complicated. A photograph does not do it justice. And that's back to the painting celebrations, saying they, they can't do these things justice. You, it, it's, the past is, and, and, and one, thing I've been, one thing I've been thinking as well, and I, and I, and I will actually say it. Um, when, I went to, when I went through the art galleries, first time in my life, I realized why, um, why I'm not too keen on museums, right? I was I was bored out of my skull, like because there was the the descriptions were really plain and dull. Nothing was in context. I saw one display cabinet in the museum where you had. I, I was looking at it, thinking, why is there why is there um, um, I, it, it, it was a, a Greek sort of um, terracotta figure, right? Why is a Greek terracotta figure um, being displayed in a cabinet alongside British Delftware from 1650? And I looked over here, there was a medieval jug. Uh, and then there was a Bellamine jar up here, which I identified from 1600. We don't really know what this is. And I'm thinking, no wonder people think museums are crap, because I think it's crap, because it's all completely out of context. It's all boring. It was so boring looking at this stuff. But when you actually see stuff in context, it actually really comes alive. It re really starts to make sense. And I'm steadily starting to realise maybe um, some museums can be very boring and displaying it in that way is not the way to do it. Uh, Flag Fen, Peterborough, Excavations and Research. This is one of three 
of Francis Pryor's pieces of work. Uh, these are the excavations um, from the later period, because obviously he's starting, this is the second publication of three, um, and this sort of a monograph itself from 1995 to 2007, looking at the work at Flag Fen itself, continues on the wonderful discoveries that are actually being made there. One of the things that we're actually, one of the things I think Flag Fen has taught us, truly and deeply, that we just can't save everything in archaeology. Trying to conserve 6,000 timbers is enough, right? Trying to conserve 60,000 timbers is quite a momentous feat. Excavating the entire trackway and all the landscape of Flag Fen, if you want to put a couple of noughts on the back of 60,000 bits of timber, right, you wouldn't find much change. You cannot save it all. Mind you, if we're in Jap Japan and China, they would. But we can't save it all in our own landscape. There's a, it's a lot more complicated. And archaeologists have to take those decisions. Uh, do, we, do we save it all? And there's an image here that proves that we can't save it all. But some of it we can. But not yet. The archaeology that you actually see in, in this um, here, this is part of the trackway itself. Can't really zoom in. Um, these timbers themselves, after they've been left in the ground because of changing conditions, completely changed now. Lots of decay, um, lots of damage being caused. Um, but it's been recorded. We've got an idea, we've got a picture, we understand what this is about. And that's really important. <coughs> you won't see this today now. Um, a lot, lots, lots of what you do see has been lifted and freeze dried, which is great. Uh, the rest of it um, has it's been recorded, photographed, planned, understood, and all the rest of it. And the rest of it backfilled or 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 has been left to decay. I know it sounds terrible, but you know we just don't have the money to preserve sixty thousand timbers, let alone all the millions <coughs> that haven't been excavated yet. But it's photographing it, it's making a record, it's trying to understand something about it, which is very important. And, and Flag Fen, and, and a site like Flag Fen is really interesting. It's not just a museum of artefacts. You've got this bit here, you can see these bits of timber, you can see the freeze dry, you can see the boat, you can see the reconstruction building, you can see the reconstruction of archaeologists, you can get an idea of the landscape, you get an idea of the landscape in the past, landscape today. This is why these type of open air sites are very, very intriguingly uh, groundbreaking in expanding our minds to understand the past in the way you should understand the past. Not looking at cabinet uh, with the archaeologists trying to make you see what they think you're meant to see and you're not actually seeing anything at all, if that makes any sense. Now, um, what, what we've got really, what we've got, the point is, um, is that when we're trying to in interpret something like this, it's really complicated because this is a site that's um, in, a, in a great sense of collapse, decay, uh, changes within the landscape. It wasn't one moment in time, again, that one moment in time. And when you actually look at this flag fan, and when you actually look at this, this is, this is close to a few moments in time, right? This is, this is Must Farm. Um, Must Farm itself. At Must Farm, what happened, you had about a, a metre of, of milk, uh, water, brackish water, uh, muds and silts and stuff, and you had these, these big posts sticking out, and then on top of that was a platform, uh, and then on top of this was an arrangement of um, Bronze Age roundhouses. I think the number's eight, but then again, probably getting confused with the Vessel Bodga, but somewhere around that, about eight structures. Um, and... What happened was that the, um, the settlement was set alight, or was it a natural occurrence, or hit by lightning, or they couldn't be asked anymore, they want to set light to it and leave, um, and I'm going to use a parallel to that. Archaeologists don't feel that you can set light to things in the past and leave and just say, oh, that's okay, you know? Uh, me and Kathy have just sort of link, sort of linked story. When, when, when we went to the island of, uh, of Hoy, there was this chap he told us one day, he said, well, back in the 1960s, uh, this guy had all these military records of, of the camps on Hoy. He had 
uh, all the history, you know, he had all the uh, inventories of absolutely everything because nobody wanted it, right? He took it into his yard and set light to the lot. lot. Am I right or wrong, Cathy? I don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> well, I do. Right, bugger. Well, anyway, he, oh, he's... Only witness. <laughs> oh, you're the only witness. No, um, Bill, I'm sure. But anyway, he, he, said, he said he knew somebody who set light to the lot, all the records. <coughs> right? So in years' time, somebody might come back to that pile and find a little bit of a charred record of, of, um, um, of HMS Troutbridge, right? Um, and they think, oh my God, you know, that's all that survives. There, there must have been a catastrophic event here. All the records were deliberately destroyed uh, because um, uh, somebody was going to steal them or something. And the actual fact is somebody destroyed them because nobody wanted them back then. Okay? It's a totally different story, okay? Totally different from what actually happened. And the danger with this type of archaeology, where you've got a village at Lust Farm, which is very close to Flag Fen, being set alight, is that, oh, there are people coming and they're threatening us, and, and there's no evidence of anyone being killed there, for one. Um, the, you, you've basically got loads of bowls with, with um, congealed, carbonised food, which settles down into the bottom of these brackish muds that very day. It's, 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 it's an event that happened in the... In the place of a day, basically the platform that the building was resting on collapsed and then all the timbers started to collapse and everything settled then into these muds and that's the roof structure itself um, and there's wattle panels and all the rest of it here right? and that's what I would call close on an event not, not an event within a few mo a minute, this happened probably over the course of a day or longer um, but this, this itself is a, is a less complicated occurrence than what's going on at Flag Fen. Flag Fen's really complicated, right? Um, but there's more going on here in the sense there's more we can understand. Because we can understand the building collapsed and we can understand the roof structure, we can understand what they put on the roof, we can understand what the walls were like, what door, what door was, how the arrangement of the building was and all the rest of it. All these really things are, are massively key um, to my understanding and everyone else's understanding of the past. So two, two huge parallels. Um, Francis, Francis Pryor um, originally thought that Flag Fen was more like this, but his ideas have actually changed. This is what <coughs> Must Farm looked like. Uh, the, the, the village at Must Farm, okay? It was all set alight and whatever, okay? But it doesn't, just because things are set alight doesn't mean to say that you're being chased by people with the huge hatchets trying to kill you. Uh, you just might just do it because you do it. And I can tell you people who just abandon sight because they do it. Terra Petra, um, Terra Petra, which is um, Black Earth. Um, it, it's it's in, in, in South, South America, um, uh, they, they've actually found sites upon sites of buildings that have just been abandoned and the village people just moved over here. So what you do, you get whole buildings which have all the stuff in them, right? And the villagers just said, oh, we just set light to that. We'll just go over there and start again. They just left everything there because they wanted to, because they felt, right, you know, we've got a lot of stuff going on here, but if we keep exhausting the landscape, we're not going to have anything. So they just leave it all and go over there and start again. So we see this in places like um, um, South America and Central America. Deliberate, right? You, you must always have an open mind when you look at the past. And look at this little building here. Now, okay, I'm rather confused which building is which, but we'll say this is the um, this is the Iron Age uh, reconstructed building, um, because if people wander around with Iron Age type costume on it. And the first thing I can say about this building is that there's something massively wrong with it. And what's massively wrong is if you look at the detail. The detail is, is that they reconstructed this building 20 years ago. I think less than that. And they just allowed it to decay. What's wrong with that? Well, nobody in their right mind is going to build a structure and just allow it to decay. You're going to maintain it. 
most archaeologists' perspectives of the past, like at St. Fagans, I've only realised what they, what I, what's been said to me and what, what's wrong. At St. Fagans, Ian Daniels said, well, we, we built these structures, right, we just left them, and then we, we then didn't do any maintenance on them, and we allowed them to, de to decay, which would assist us understand when we excavated actual genuine Bronze Age and Iron Age buildings. Um, um, and I've actually realised what he's been saying is like poppycock, because nobody in their right mind is going to go through the effort of building a Bronze Age building in the Bronze Age and not maintain it. You're going to maintain it on a very, very regular uh, basis. So, so the archaeologists saying, oh, what we're going to do, we're going to allow this building to collapse, and when it's collapsed, it'll help, help us to understand how things lie in the ground. In, and it just doesn't work like that. You know, you're going to maintain this building. You're going to redorb it every year or so, uh, fill in the cracks. You're going to render on the outside, which is what a proper building um, in the Iron Age and Bronze Age would have been like. And you know what? Somebody else pointed something else to me as well. Uh, they they said they said about something known as the drip line. Okay, the drip line. Um, when when you've got a roof, there's a drip line around the outside. The reason why this wonderful greenery is growing a lot under the drip line is because it's constantly being fed with water and moisture off the roof. And then somebody said, isn't that a bit stupid to have a drip line? I said, what do you mean? And they said, well, if you have a bit of overhang and there's a drip line, isn't the water going to come straight under the wall again and flood your building? Isn't the, isn't the, isn't the, isn't the water going to gather up outside the building? Yes, didn't think this. Is no water going to build around the outside of the building and actually sort of start damaging the door? But I actually said, you're actually right. Have you ever seen this on, a, a, have you ever seen a drip line created where, where you've got, you've got a roof, you've got a little bit of a furrow around the outside and it's sort of slightly inverted. Have you ever seen an example of that on an Iron Age or Bronze Age village that's been excavated, but building? And the answer is no. With a pen, if you dig all the way around, you used to dig all the way around and then do a little channel so the water could drain away. I don't see the problem. But anyway, all the cows and sheep would have eaten that grass. Ah, but you're missing the point. The point is, the point, the point is, is why aren't you collecting this water? Okay? There's no evidence of a depression around the outside of these buildings unless you're digging a ditch. Okay? I haven't seen it. I'm not in any of the images I've seen. I've right? seen ditches around buildings. But they must be collecting the water some way. This is a perfect way of collecting water. When people talk about Iron Age um, bank and ditch enclosures, like the one at Colhue Bay at the Hill Fort down there, they say, you know, the, the half a dozen buildings that were there to look after the Hill Fort, where did they get their water from? Well, why didn't you collect it from your roof? But a lot of it soaks in on the thatch. Mm, have you seen yeah, the heavy yeah, rain yeah, recently? Yeah, I stayed in the thatch. Have you seen the heavy rain recently? What I'm trying to get at... No gutters, they no how do you know they weren't collecting the water? The fact of the matter is, right, we're still a bit grey in understanding yeah. these sites. That's what I'm saying. Whether you agree with me or not, Cathy, yes, is that I do. Yes. there's lots of different ways of looking at these buildings, and unfortunately, the reconstructions are agonisingly the same every bloody time. And I wish archaeologists would start to move their minds a bit more. And the other thing as well is, right, my goat would be able to leap on, leap on top of that roof, uh, roof yeah. and it would do a hell of a lot of damage. Well, but you'd cut them up there, wouldn't you? I mean, that, yeah. do you? Do you really ask the amount of damage a goat would do to my roof? Um, well, you do, so it just doesn't grow wildly. Like you could have a sheep. Would... Oh, yeah. right. And anyway, with the smoke coming through, they it do, this is it, Animals. What I'm trying to look at, again, we're looking at all these different areas, and, and it's just, is it right, is it wrong? Moving on, moving on, what we're going to do, we're going to take a break in three minutes, isn't oh, it? With all so the you get trees spoken <coughs> With all the regulations, you can't have the animals wandering all around nowadays, can you? So it's never going to be right. Because somebody might catch something. <laughs> it's only a reconstruction. Um, that, 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 build, that building there um, is actually... That building there a little bit. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Oh, yeah. You can imagine, right, that there, okay, the green stuff on the roof. So have you got a hole in the top again? No, no, this is... No, well, those, those pictures. No, this is before. Stuff, smoke this stuff. is before and oh, after. No, but they used to believe they did have holes in the top. No, they haven't put... Oh, the well, problem... Is, now. 
The problem is because they haven't maintained the buildings, right? They 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 they're not really. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll look at this, but that's what it, that's what it did look like, and it, you know, nice wall around the outside, and obviously, yeah, the the, the, the rest of the thatch had been completed and all the rest of it, but unfortunately, when you don't maintain these buildings, they start to collapse. Um, this is that same building. It's not in a good state, is it? And this isn't after many years. You're not going to allow this to happen. You are going to maintain it. This is not a good demonstration and representation of the past. Get people in maintaining these buildings for Pete's sake. Let's see something proper job. Well, as with a lot of modern thatch, they frequently don't they don't take the old stuff off. They still shove a new load on top. Well, I've seen that. Um, Flip by neck. Yeah. So layer upon layer, darling. I've 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 also seen a thatch roof which has got a, a slate roof on top. Well, there's one there's one on the other side of town here. One of the last that's one, not not the one down Beach Road. They've got a slate, slate roof on top of the thatch. Got, yeah. Apparently. I don't know how, I've never been able to work out how that works. Right. Anyway, so what we're going to do, we're going to take, we're going to take a break in a, in a moment. But what I'm going to say, right, is, um, right, going back to Francis Pye, admire him, I think he's a brilliant archaeologist, right? I know I'm having to go at the reconstruction stuff, but, but if I didn't, I, I would be completely unbiased with my uh, hero worship of Francis Pryor. But what I, what I would say is that Francis Pryor from day one managed to get the standards on the archaeology at, at um, uh, these, le the, these excavations smack on. Right? The level of excavation was, 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 was pristine, was perfect. Just like this excavation of the uh, Yamon culture um, settlement in Japan. The Yamon culture was a really thriving culture in Japan over 2,000 years ago. Not exactly contemporary with where, where we're going, but, but, but they get similar buildings which they're excavating, a Japanese excavation. Um, and in fact, the excavations at Must Farm, if anyone saw them a couple of years ago, don't have any more images of that, there was a hangar over it as well, and the excavations were perfect. So, so in certain, certain areas of archaeology across the world, we, 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 we have a bit more time and money to be placed into Bronze Age and Iron Age structures. And this is what you see today in the, in the building, in the house, that they allow you to see bits of um, the, the trackway itself, the 3,350-odd-year-old the, the 3, trackway. And you can see it's decaying there, right? But it gives you an idea of, of what this briefly looked like. And what they've got, they've got another area where they've got all the timbers and they, they've freeze-dried them. So in the future, it'll be a bit, bit like a Jorvik experience where you'll be able to see the freeze-dried ones, which are immaculate. And then obviously the decaying examples. I think what they're trying to say is, you know, with all best will in the world, we're giving you an opportunity to see these things. And you're lucky to see them. But unfortunately, because we're allowing you to see them, you are in turn causing damage to the archaeology. Um, just to quench your curiosity. But they've got another experience coming. And this is, this is that ideal. Um, so what we're going to do, we're, we're going we're gonna to take, take a break. Um, and... Um, and apparently Jane's got a big pack of Kit Kats for us all. Um, so any questions? So what I'm going to mention before we have a break, um, anyone interested in my Lantwick Major Ghost Walk tomorrow? Dennis, you coming, babe? I'm coming. Dennis, I, I knew you'd be coming, De Dennis, babe. Um, the forecast was pitting rain. Well, I've got 25 people who've paid to go on it, so I don't care. Um, they just bring umbrellas along. Uh, Dennis dresses up in his... Um, uh, long sort of a barber jacket. Uh, so will I. Any questions? No. no? So we'll do the shackles and stuff. Um, and any questioners that need to come in, right? Please do. And um, Peter and Alan, we, we need to sort of have a chat at the end. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Say no more. Let's get straight down to our undies and see which colour they are. Okay. Right. So we, we were we, we're still waiting for my doodads. Oh, uh, if you press the button, it works. Good. So we were talking about the intriguing site of Flag Fen, and um, we've still got a, a fair bit to look at. So we'll try and get through that now. So I was say, I was saying before um, I was saying before the break about um, looking at archaeology and it, it's decaying and it's deteriorating even though as much water as they can spray at it. What they've got, they've got examples of these posts in another building that are freeze-dried 
uh, and uh, I think the plan is to actually lay them out to give you an, um, a better impression of what the sweep track looks like, an area that will last for quite a long time, like the archaeological exhibitions that we see at the likes of the um, Ever Arkham Centre, the Jorvik Viking Centre. So, this is the um, Iron Age reconstructed building. Okay, no, that again, it's the Bronze Age one, sorry. Oh. No, it's the Iron Age one, no, sorry, you're getting it wrong. Yeah, sorry, sorry. This is the Iron Age reconstructed building and um, the one that we've been looking at. We look inside the Bronze Age one. And obviously the clean mistakes are is that they're allowing decay to fit in and also I am told that the reason why the level of doorway is like this is health and safety. <laughs> so therefore, so much whenever <laughs> anyone goes to a site like this, they should be told... Hang on a minute. Have you ever been to the Broch of Mouser with me and Michelle in dark crevices? No. When me and Michelle went to the Broch of Mouser on Shetland, uh, we, were, we, were, we were told straight away that there's um, something structurally wrong about the structure. In the 1920s, when they started doing tourist visits out there, lots of women objected that they had to sort of duck down to go into oh. the building. Right. So what they did... They, 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 they demolished the top lintel, which in turn started to cause subsidence to this 12 um, and a half metre tall original brook standing structure from the um, early Iron Age. Um, and they had to put another stone lintel in, which I think is a con concrete lintel. I was so peed off at this point. Um, and you could just walk in there like this, when in fact before it was like this, because there was a fire inside. And it's with that principle as well that the, the, the heat needs to settle at a certain level. But sometimes I don't have to have a low doorway, so why can't they? Um, the Welsh aunts are bumping about. Oh well, <laughs> well, 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 you should see my missus. She's only um, she's only small. She could just walk through. So most most women in Wales are short and fat. So well, you know. Um, so <laughs> so. No, Michelle's not fat. She's fine, but but she's short, so she she could just wander in like this. You know? um, so anyway, oh, okay. so you're so tactless, Carl. I can't believe it. <laughs> so um, so this building itself, this building itself is a very poor reconstruction. Um, in in essence, that we don't have maintenance. Now maintenance is key to understanding these buildings when you actually go inside them. And we are going to go inside both the Bronze, exam Bronze Age example and the Iron Age example. Going back to this, uh, the Brock and Mouser as well, um, it, it was just such a shame that you're, you're inside, looking at the inside, and suddenly you've got a huge entranceway with a huge blast of wind coming towards you. So it just doesn't work. And, and the entranceway looks out at the sea. So you're going to get a huge blast of air coming in there. But with a lower lintel you're not going to get that breeze. Because what happens with the Brock and Mouster, you sort of, um, in, I think initially you would actually dr um, drop down and you drop back up. But because they, they raise the lintel level of a, a metre, the air just comes straight in. And it really wrecks the effect. Absolutely, completely. So. It's just not, not right, is it? It's not a reason. It's not. Until Jan and John. Yeah. With your little roundhouse. Would you build it like this? No, no exactly. I think that says it all. I think that says it all. I bet he tells me to build it. Um, and th this is... Now this is... Because I told you they were very similar. This is the Bronze Age one. And guess what they've done with the Bronze Age one? Look at it. It's absolutely worse. And, 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 and if they've got no door on the outside and they're telling people this, this is how a Bronze Age building looked. Um, and this is, this is, this is and, and that should actually be down there. So this you sort of copy it and go inside. Saying, this is a Bronze Age building, except for, and then list it <laughs> <of them. laughs> That is not a Bronze Age building. The, th the thing is, the other thing as well is, um, we, we, we've got proof as well that... Um, What's obviously causing damage to this is the water is just coming off and building and affecting the walls. That's proof. That, that's, that's the reconstruction proof. Because the dampness is obviously causing this decay. 
you, you, the, the, there wouldn't be this level of decay if it wasn't for groundwater, and the groundwater is just coming off the roof and heading straight in there. And that's again the drip line idea. That's how long would they stay in one place? This is the Bronze Age, yeah. permanent settlement. Oh, right. um, the other thing is, the, you, what, what we've got to do about the past is I think if people were comfortable in the locality, they would have stayed there. Rule one, right? The other rule is, goes against rule one, is that people may have been comfortable in an area, but they decided to move anyway. Because like the Amazonian people, they knew, the Amazonian people were, were quite up here, right? They, they, they used to think, um, they used to think, for example, that if, if suddenly you've got everything in one spot and everything's plentiful, that's going to end. So when you get to that point, you just move somewhere else. That's probably right. And they were right. Well, that's of course it is. They, they, well, they were right. When you got, exactly. Even though you've got everything, you move on. Yeah? <coughs> yeah, exactly. But they knew that. They knew that. So back, back, back to back to all this. That answered that question. So what we need to do, Jane? Yeah. Oh, no, um, sure. Um, so we've got showed the the ongoing work at the site is to actually bring schools along and they experience the archaeology and the, and the history and hands-on archaeology. And what we're going to do, right? Don't say anything, right? Just just feel what you feel about this image. And then, hang on a minute, and feel what you feel about this image, okay? But don't say anything, because we're going to get to this in a short while, before Jane and Ellen has to leave. So we're going to go back again, right? So what we're going to do, um, I'm going to say one thing, that you're looking at this, and there's, the fire's gone out, and the other thing as well is the ground level, right? The ground level. Within a building like this initially, in the Iron, not initially, in the Iron Age and the Bronze Age, from the archaeology, whenever we excavate these buildings, the ground is solid, right? There's, there's, no, there's no bits of dust scattered all around it when we excavate. It's a solid floor, right? In the reconstructed examples, in lots of cases, other than one where they've got it right at Flag Fen, <coughs> the ground level's loose and dusty, which would never have been the case in a building like this. It would have been compacted because they'd be walking, walking on it all the time. Out, not just Why not? Exactly. And the obviously, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm maybe overdoing this day. I'm sorry, but they haven't. Uh, what happens when you don't maintain the wattle and orb, okay, uh, between the eave, the, the eave level between the building and the roof, it starts to decay. So what they've had to do, they put had to put a protective covering around the outside so it doesn't look right when you go in there. Uh, and the fire, fire in the past in an Iron Age or Bronze Age building would be built, bur burning 24-7. It would be burning all the time, like a modern central heating system, if we're all reminded. You're meant to keep your heating heating system on all the time, aren't you, Jan? Mm -hmm. Apparently you are. Mm -hmm. That's the immersion, is it? No, you're supposed to keep your central yeah, heating no, system on yeah, all the time. I thought yeah. it was the immersion, because obviously... Takes less to the top as you take it down. Yeah, essentially, you're, you're supposed to keep it on all the time. Yeah. I'm not. Says the electric company, is it? Or yeah, the yeah, yeah it says the guy who comes to the house, exactly. Yeah. 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 I think, like, in Argo, you're supposed to keep it yeah. on. Yeah. John just said maybe to stop yeah. shock to the pipes. It is to stop shock, yes. Anyway, shh. Okay. We're, we're having Jan and Goff arguing. Ja um, not Jan, Jane. Jan and Jane, for God's sake. It's like a, it's like a sex novel. Oh, so I didn't say that. Then. What's that? You missed that, Jane. <laughs> the Jane and Jan books. Anyway. So, you're obviously getting the experience of the site, and uh, we haven't said much about the wooden, um, the wooden alignment and the wooden trackway itself, which was used from radiocarbon dating evidence from 1,350 years to 950 years BC. There's a point to be made here. When you do look at the timbers themselves, um, you see that the timbers are of lots of different dates when they're radiocarbon dated, right? Which is, again has ramifications for the reconstruction of the trackway. They've got a section of reconstructed trackway, it looks great, 
Well, it did when they reconstructed it um, 25, 30 years ago. Now, it's all decaying and falling apart and whatever, right? And you only need to look at the archaeology that tells us that over 300 years they maintained that trackway with regular new posts. Um, that's why they've got loads of different dendrochronology uh, dating for the posts. That it was a trackway that was used for over 300 years mm -hmm. and maintained. Um, so this site itself is, is an amazing site. <clears throat> With all my little bits of criticism, there's lots of positives I've been saying about it as well. It's, 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 it could be said one of, one of the only places in Britain where you have um, a, a maximum experience in the past. Um, Flag Fen was established, as we say, in the Bronze Age, but there's Neolithic activity within that landscape. Um, and with the wooden causeway of what they know so far of having 60,000 uh, timbers and obviously all the other timbers that they haven't found, it, it sort of makes this site um, one of the most important uh, resources of timber archaeology to be seen anywhere in Britain, going back to the Bronze and the Iron Age. We've got lots of Roman sites that lots of timber has survived. But looking at the Bronze and the Iron Age, this is one of those great resources alongside um, the Glastonbury um, villages um, that were also excavated at the turn of the last century. Coming back to the causeway um, that was built at Flag Fen, um, this particular structure gave a lot of new information to the archaeologists. After careful analysis of the tree ring, researchers were able to conduct that the wooden causeway um, was, was used for a certain length of time, as we've already said, and was just left and allowed to decay over a certain time in history. The last post to have any date, to be a bit more precise, dates to that it was found some time around 967 BC. So not just using radiocarbon dating, they're using dendrochronology tree ring dating, which is as accurate within a few months. And that's the final felling date of the timber that they've extracted is 967 BC. There may be later ones and there may be earlier ones. So about, about 20 to 30 years after that, <coughs> we can guess that the track lane was abandoned. And how do we know that? The reconstructed example uh, that was built 30 years ago has started to decay. So without constantly restoring it, that's what will happen. So that's a good indicator. So within about 30 years of that date, after it, the causeway was abandoned. Within the landscape of Flag Fen, within the Fen itself, they found swords, gold earrings and spear heads. Five minutes yet, Jane, before you can leave. Yes, I um, And people's interpretation of the archaeology is that all, all, all those golden objects, bits of swords, bits of spearheads, earrings, are, are they associated with people who are extremely rich? Is there a certain period in time that people are depositing these wonderful things uh, within the landscape alongside the track? Was the trackway just used for votive offerings into the stagnant water at the time? The answer is maybe that's one use of the trackway. What about looking at simple things? Using the trackway to fish off. Using the trackway to get to, from A to B. Nobody thinks of that one. Or using the trackway to simply look out at the beautiful view that was and still is the landscape of Flag Fen. Conclusion, these, these were some things that you should know about Flag Fen. Uh, the site is incredibly historical. And as work goes on at the site, more things are found and discovered and understood. Uh, so I want to quick, quickly um, look at this image. So what we've got, we've got, uh, as you come into the site, um, it sort of indicates that this landscape here is where the one kilometre long trackway um, sort of goes across the site. And interestingly enough, um, over here, they found evidence of a Roman road. And strangely enough, it runs directly parallel with the, um, this wonderful Bronze Age trackway, a Roman road running parallel with the trackway. Why didn't the Romans build it directly on top of the trackway? The Romans built their road ex very similarly to the trackway, basically posts into the ground. Um, so you've got the verticals and you've got horizontal beams across. 
The difference with the Roman road and the trackway is that the Romans put various layers on top of it, turf layer, and then they put gravel on top of it, and that made a trackway across the fen. It tells you again that the fen remained important within the Roman period. This is that sort of one that you've already seen with the timbers um, in, in the description. And over here, they restore, um, they're using this building here to sort of uh, restore and freeze dry some of the other timbers that, that uh, I've been mentioning. Reconstructed builds of the Bronze Age, Iron Age ones over here. Uh, and there is a nice little bit of a reconstruction uh, building. Preservation tanks um, there. And you've got obviously got the two uh, that you can actually see from um, Must Farm as well on display at the site. Um, yeah. N not right, really. Um, big old door. Uh, it's a bit of a big old door. For you, you tall, evil person, you. <laughs> um, now, okay, right. I just We haven't got a lot of time, so I'm just going to ask five, f f four, four people to build a consensus. Would you like to, um, don't say yet, would you like to live in this Iron Age building, which I'm not sure the reconstruction's right, because I think... The wall would have been directly against these pillars inside, but that's something else. But would you live in this Iron Age building if this is accurate, or would you live in this Bronze Age structure, right? This Bronze Age structure, nice beaten floor, stable floor. Uh, this one, very weak, horrible floor, whatever, because they haven't worked things out properly. Come on then, Alan, which one? Don't be swayed by what he said. A, <laughs> A or B? A. You go with A. Uh, that door, what about what about you? A or B? A. Dennis. A. Do you all? B. Uh, uh, yeah. Is the second one actually a roundhouse? <laughs> uh, the second, the second, the second one is actually a roundhouse. Yes. Uh, a. You go with A. Yeah. It's a few B. You've had your thought. You said consensus. Thought. I'm trying to get my consensus, which should be a B. Uh, go on, oh, <laughs> go on and on and on and on until you get the results you want. It's like Brexit. But the fact of the matter is, I would personally go with B. So those who went for B, why did you go for I B? I really did I say B. Dennis, why did you go for B? <laughs> I think it's more better with the two. Um, I know the fire's not lit there. Um, I think, I think it's <laughs> you prefer B. Better, you know, but uh, reproduce better. Yeah, something. yeah. So not, neither of them are perfect. No, they're they? not. So they're I think not. B is the better of the two. Exactly. So I'll just say goodbye to these two. Come on, we haven't got all the day, Alan. Flipping egg. Oh, don't be mean. I'm going out down the beach because low tide to have a look for the forest. Kathy, you're not going as well, are you? Yes. I said I wanted to. Oh. Okay, you guys stay here and I'll say goodbye to the three crones. It's like a bloody. Th those around them. Cauldron. Right. Right. Show. Ta -ta. right, okay then. Okay. Well, I'll see you, I'll see you next time. Oh, I'm sure. The petrified forest. Why do you want to be Harry Potter when you're speaking like that? Mm. That will be in conjunction with the full moon, maybe. If it's a low tide, yeah. or vice versa. Normally. High, high, or low, low? Spring tides. Spring tides. Next couple of days. Mm, that'd be the explainer, then. Spring tides. Spring. 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 Mm -hmm. We should Google it. We know what he was saying earlier, but we should have thought we did the most. We don't have to talk these two. Oh, right. Some random facts that's on there. We used to, didn't we, then the tide? Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, you have a splash. No, you might have it, yeah. You've got one of these ones you can sit on to make fire. It's purposely for fishing. Yeah. Mm. I don't like to see. Oh, God. We got rid of the three old crones. Now we can now we can have a decent class. Yes, yes. Um, right. You could show up as well. Um, I'm, not, I'm, not say, I'm not saying what they say about you when you're not here, God. I don't care. <laughs> Oh, yeah, we, we do love Kathy to bits. She was, she was well behaved today. Yes. Yeah, very annoyed you didn't know the ends. <laughs> Hang on a minute. Whose bag is that on the seat? That's mine. That's mine. Well, what a sissy. What? What's wrong with that? It's a girl's bag. It's not a girl's bag. I thought that's just like the shopping bag. Yeah. Is there flowers on it? Good no, it's not a girl's bag. It is. You'd love a bag like that, Cal. Anyway, I'd love one like that. You could carry it. Oh, I'd carry it all the yeah. way. Right, okay. <laughs> Again, uh, looking at the reconstruction of the Iron Age building. Um, I'm out of old people, John, I'm surprised you went with the Iron Age one, but um, I, I'm for the I'm for the Bronze Age one, and probably for the Bronze Age one. But then again, it's a very difficult thing to say because. Unless these things are done smack on, you can't really make that judgment, can you? You can't really make that judgment. I before. just thought for the first one, the Bronze Age one, because it was a little bit smaller, it would be warmer. Yeah. But also had a lit fire in it, innit? So, so, well, so like almost like a. Not hang a on, this is the Bronze Age one. Yeah, that's the one I went for. That was no, this was B. Was it? Oh. Oh my god! I screwed up all the. <laughs> no, this was B. But that's A. The fact that it's got a flat a fire on it, though, I think people instantly think, oh, it looks better. I don't it's think a it fire, but it's I, cozy. I, I, I don't sorry? Think it looks cozy. Yeah, I don't oh, think they've actually. Yeah. <laughs> the door's ridiculous. So yeah. that yeah. The door is ridiculous. <laughs> that was B. Now say! Ah, well, and that's B. That's the water. That's. Hang on a minute! That's it's A. No, that's B! <laughs> no, hang on a minute! That's. That's, that's A, B. right? Yeah, right. And that's B! Well, right. Dennis and I got confused with A and B, didn't we? Yeah, I chose the other one thinking it was B. Yes, and me too. You go with B. I Ah, you that see? One. This this is what Brexit, you see? People have changed their minds afterwards. <laughs> We're doomed, wrong information. We're doomed, exactly. See, yes. the wrong information to start with, with Brexit. Yeah, you can exactly. use this with switching the pictures. So now, now he's going to be a lead voter. Moving on. Um... Right, so there you go. That looks a bit like a uh, John on acid. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Sorry, John. I mean, double down. You get around the air like that, John. Oh, this lecture's breaking down now. Right, so obviously. Um, Oh God, let's get off these bloody buildings. You know what they look like by now. So anyway, um, so the, the, one, the one thing about the flag fen landscape is that, um, you know, it's, it's within its throes of, of, of being a site 3,500 years ago. So, so between 3,500 years ago and about 3,000 years ago, because of the evidence that we get from the trackway, the site's abandoned. And there's no real reason why the site's abandoned. But there's evidence within the buildings, the, the, the roundhouses they, they've actually excavated at Black Fen, that the, the buildings were seemingly abandoned, very similar to the buildings being abandoned at Must, Must Farm, probably about a similar time. What's going on? The you could, archaeologists could basically argue you know, that there's a, a, a horde of people coming from somewhere and everybody's got to leave. But where are those people coming from? Did it just you, doesn't make sense. Did you say they were there for like a thousand, uh, five hundred years. years? Right, so it wouldn't be like weather or orientated making a move. Not for five hundred <laughs> years. If it been a the, the thing is, it's quite a stable there. landscape. But, but East Anglia it's horrendous. The wind coming yes. off because we lived there. I, I lived. Um, you can imagine in between, Norway. in between Cambridge and Peterborough. Yeah. From, my eighty four we moved in eighty seven. Quite flat land, isn't it? And it's really really and when the wind blows there, it's not a nice place. And the dikes that you know, the fe in the, the fens, you know, the dikes you keep saying that they're everywhere. Yeah. Not just like in certain places. You go along the road and you just like chew dike the other side each side of the road and you're 
even now. And that was 87 we left there. And you can imagine when there's flooding events, it would have been quite catastrophic, even more um, then well, when the than snow it is came, now. So when the snow comes, it's really bad over there as well, because there's nothing to stop it, so the wind that's right. blows it. So that's why I was asking how long they were there. So, but, but they're there for they're, they're looking like they're there for about five hundred years, which is quite some time. Yeah, it is. Um, and the what 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 we're thinking about and the causeway itself to construct the causeway itself um, was such symbols such, such as oak that would not have been native to that environment is is that they're bringing these timbers in as well, okay. and when they're building the trackway, and they're building the structures there. Within a landscape that's very marshy, you can only work out two things. There's not going to be a lot of trees within that landscape. No, so, so whatever way you look at it, forget about when the site was abandoned, right? Uh, that just takes us into nowhere. Forget about the site when it was abandoned. Just think about the effort that was made to construct the walkway, the trackway, and also to construct, construct the buildings there. And the ones that must found. There's more flag pens that must found farms around the landscape. And you know, I, I can remember um, a lecture years ago. I remember talking about um, what had happened in the Bronze Age. People were no longer living in the upland areas, so they're having to move into the lowland areas, meaning that all the people were living in the lowland areas, and there was conflict. Not military conflict, there was conflict for, for land. So therefore, moving into these marshy areas, um, people moved into these marshy areas because there was nowhere else for them to go. And that might be why they're there. For if there was nowhere else to, for them to go, they were able to obtain the resources to build the trackway in the first place. So it, 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 there's, a bit of, um, there's a bit of not knowing what's going on. And this is why when you go to places like Norfolk, that the people have got strange ways of looking at life. It's a strange landscape. Uh, I've heard lots of radio things about um, Norfolk and Suffolk and, and Essex, um, and they've got a different way of looking at it. They, they, they know the landscape that they're living in, but they also respect it at the same time, and you've got to respect the landscape like that. Now, what I'm going to say now, whether it's going to contradict with anything I've said, it doesn't matter. The, the purpose... Many items denoting rank and prestige were deposited in the water around flag fen landscape. As I said, swords, spearheads, earrings, brooches and pins. Archaeologist Francis Pryor, who discovered the site in 1982, suggested then that settlers often vied for social status by showing they could afford to discard valuable possessions. Uh, and obviously breaking daggers and putting them in the water as well. But there is one problem with that, right? Um, who are they showing off to? Because there's not going to be many people living in that landscape anyway. That's a sacrifice. Yeah, 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 offerings to... Then there's that, the idea of sacrifice, which would be the idea of Mike Parker Pearson. Um, other finds included small polished white stones. These white stones, stones are not native to that landscape, so they've got to be brought in from somewhere. <laughs> They've been collected and transported intentionally to the site. Other artefacts include animal bones, particularly horse mandibles. They're saying that the remains of the horses are quite significant to the site. And why are the, the remains of horses, the skulls and the mandibles being deposited in the water significant? Well, one, the horse is not going to get there naturally and sort of get bogged down and die in that environment. So the skulls are going to be brought, needed to be brought into there to be deposited in the first place. And they say, we, we, we know full well that the horse would have been a powerful symbol of that period in history. And it's still a powerful, period, uh, it's still a powerful symbol uh, to lots of people in Britain. Um, and what do we mean? When you look at the likes of the Uppington horse uh, in Wiltshire, you've got, you've got the scouring of the hill and the, and the uh, etching in of the white horse. Um, that's that's our early, one of the earliest representations of uh, a petroglyph um, in Britain over 3,000 years ago. That's exactly the same time that people are depositing horse skulls and mandibles within that landscape. So the horse is highly significant. How close to the coast is this? This is this is quite this is quite some distance. Oh, right. This isn't exactly close, but it's going to be it's going to be inundated by water at a whim. But the horse itself. 
um, replacing manpower, a means of transport, putting people on sledges, all very important, matching the likes of the canoes. We've shown you on the plan, basically, where, th where there's a bit of a lake and there's, there's two little islands, yeah? And one of those islands is, is an original island that the trackway actually went through. And we'll just, um, I'll show you that when we finish. I know I'll show you now. We'll be finishing in about, uh, about seven minutes or so. So what we're talking about is the next thing we're going to talk about is basically there, where you've got a museum, Northerly, Northerly Island, and on that bit there, no, not that, no, I'll get the two mixed up, that one there, that one there, um, where, they, where they've excavated, <laughs> and it says as follows, it says about that, um, when, they've, when they've excavated there, they found barrows that are above the remains of buildings. And on top of that, those, those barrows, they got the remains of sheep. And the only thing that can be dragged from this is that at one point, this little natural islet within this marshy sort of landscape that the trackway goes to, um, it was originally used for people to live. One use, see multi-level history. Then people were buried there, another level of history. And people were taken out there, um, sheep were taken out there to graze. Because <coughs> they've got lots of remains of um, bits of sheep and stuff out there as well. Um, and all, the, all these, um, all this tells you is that um, the landscape is changing a great deal over that period of three, four, five hundred years. Different uses, different understandings. The structure and preservation, because of its waterlogged condition, the Flank Fen Basin was an area where peat deposit started to deposit even before they started building houses and trackways there um, 1,500 years ago. Uh, 1,500 years BC, 3,500 years ago. Archaeologists just believed that the community uh, was destroyed um, by a fire that damaged the posts that held the homes above the waterlogged earth causing the dwellings to collapse into the river and forcing the inhabitants to flee. Um, that's a really crap sentence, really. You're going to flee before the building set alight, surely. But the point is, is that we don't really know. Eventually everything's preserved and the anaerobic conditions generated by silt deposits from the fens protected the wooden posts. Um, and slowly but surely, as I've said earlier on, the landscape starts to clog up with all that rich soil and stuff. Even though the, water, the ground level is rising, it all gets clogged up by all that stuff washed in. All the silts and all that rich agricultural soil. One quick thing about the archaeological investigation about the site. When it was dis uh, discovered in 1982, um, the, the work on surveying the dikes and to sort of uh, clean some of them out were being um, funded by English Heritage. So it meant that Francis Pryor had some funding to do the work. And as Francis Pryor in his own words said, he stumbled literally upon um, Flag Fen uh, when I tripped on a piece of wood lying in the bottom of a drainage ditch. And if it wasn't for him stumbling over that piece of timber, it's likely that Must Farm would never have been found. It's likely that Flag Fen would never have been found. They would have drained the landscape. The archaeology would have been destroyed forever and nobody would have ever known that there was a trackway buildings a whole settlement and people living within that <coughs> landscape. So by doing that, they're able to now, uh, they're able to think about the archaeology um, before they start draining the tracts of landscape and preserve some of the archaeology before it's lost forever. Another strange fact, they found the oldest surviving wooden wheel on the site as well. 3,500 year old wheel, and they actually found one of the must farm as well in the excavations there. Go on. Finds on the site for you yes. To see. yes, 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 that's the good thing. See, a multi level. So you're not only just seeing the finds, thinking, oh, that's boring, and you're going outside and thinking, oh, that's interesting, and you go back and see the finds, and you think, oh my god, these finds are interesting. Because you give context to the finds. The most boring thing in the world is actually going to a museum and it says, oh, this is a gold coin, or this is a Roman brooch, and you just go out. And then somebody said, actually, so and so wore this gold brooch, and this coin means this and that. And you go back to the brooch and you go to the coin, and those two things come alive. That's what this stuff should be about. And then excavation work is still ongoing. They, 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 
um, from 2012, um, they, uh, because they finished the excavations in 2007, they reopened them in 2012, more excavations, crowdfunding archaeology at this time by Dig Ventures, and their students go in there and are doing research, and for a time, going to the site was a, bare, was a very boring preoccupation, visitor numbers dropped, and said, Francis Pryor said, we've got to get people in handling the archaeology. We've got to get them touching the artefacts. Don't get them looking in a cabinet being bored stiff. Do that experience I'm talking about. And then suddenly, um, the numbers at the site um, from 2015 went up by 20, uh, 29%. So by having this experience, more people visit the site. So what they've got with the timbers, um, there's extensive drainage in the surrounding area, um, threatening the archaeology. Um, but they are removing lots of the timbers, um, uh, sections of poles of the trackway, replacing the cellulose in the wood by uh, water-carried wax, impregnating the wood over the years. And then this technique can then be used to display the timbers to members of the public for the next thousand years without any decay um, in their preservation halls on the site. Um, and the, these techniques are being used for, by other sites when they actually found Seahenge in Norfolk um, they use the techniques that they've been using at um, Blackfen to preserve um, Sea Henge. And some final notes now. In um, 1990, when Francis Pryor published his book on Blackfen, known Blackfen Prehistoric Fenland Se uh, Centre, that was his first book. Another big publication, uh, the Blackfen Basin Archaeology and the Environment of a Fenland Landscape. Um, and then his final publication, Blackfen Life and Death of a Prehistoric Landscape. It, it is what he has described as a major revision of his work of 1991, for instance, repudiating his earlier lake village concept. So it's not just about a lake village, it's about a diverse landscape, he's starting to say. Just a few quick images, and we'll just go through these quick. Bit of reconstruction archaeology there, um, before you see any of the faults. Uh, there's, there's his Francis Fryer's uh, book, Flag Fen. I advise anyone interested in sort of this type of archaeology needs to get hold of this book. So it's that northerly island where I was describing Ooh. where you've got the, 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 the burial mounds and underneath that you've got the houses and so on and so on. Um, that's what it looks like today. Very different from what it did look like, but they, they need this. They need to keep sort of the water ground level there, um, otherwise it will all dry out. And that's some of the, what well, the timbers... Um, you used to be able to see what you, the timbers that you see today are nothing to what you were seeing 30 years ago because obviously they're decaying. Even though the amount of water you spray on them, they're still decaying. Um, and there's a bit of a droveway there, um, and they've got evidence of droving of um, cattle and so on. Uh, before, um, I, I know Goff is interested in Fergies and Ford uh, tractors. This is a Fergie. Um, so um, I've no idea what this Fergie's doing along. So what what they're doing? They're, they're uh, as they're widening the reams and they're working on the reams. They're working on the archaeology. This is an ongoing thing. This is an ongoing thing at Flagfen. Again, from what you're seeing now, from what you could have seen a few years ago, again it's deteriorating. But obviously they've got other stuff now that you'll be able to see. That's what it did used to look like the trackway. What, 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 there, what there was, there was um, these upright timbers with interceding beams in between them. Um, I think what you've got is various causeways of this, but um, extremely well preserved. There are, there's two other trackways being found in Britain, one in Somerset and I think one sort of uh, near Reading Way. Um, very similar in date, but again, more of these timbers. Obviously sectioning some of these timbers to get a good idea. Uh, again, Francis Pryor, um, Life and Death of the Prehistoric Landscape, another version of his book. And one thing I was saying, that's what this looks like after 30 years. That's in the um, winter months, and you can see, if you don't maintain this, it's going to collapse. Mind you, I'm a bit suspicious over what material they're using. That looks like pine to me, which wouldn't last long. Um, but... But it's a bit of a reconstruction archaeology, again, proving the fact if you don't maintain it after 30 years, it starts to collapse. And um, animals, 
goats and various breeds of um, sheep and I think they've got cattle there, I'm not sure, uh, being used at the site. Um, any questions? No? Alan and uh, Peter, you need to stay behind. Okay. Sp speed it up then because the pub's calling. <laughs> all right, all right. You know, we've got to do this properly. You know, we've got to do this properly. You give me the black market coin, I'll give you some money. It's not. All good. right then. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a secret. <laughs> anyway, any questions, folks? Black market coin, you're really yeah. you know, painting me as a right dodgy. No, 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 no. no. I don't think they have, but they, they've estimated it's about a kilometre in length. So they don't have the sort of quarry or mine at one end of it? I don't, no, no, nothing that I've come across in all my years, no. No. Any other questions? No, no. Right, right Gillian, apparently you've been volunteered um, to do the dishes. Um, oh, quickly! Oh, hang on! Shut up, you! Hilda, the Iron Age Druid reconstruction in wax. A student has revealed the face of the female Druid from the Iron Age in a 3D um, wax reconstruction. Uh, believed to have been more than 60 years old when she died on the 15th of August uh, in the year um, 55 BC. And th there, there she is. So uh, Kathy, when she gets up in the morning. Because she's not here. <laughs> she, she wouldn't mind. Mm. Six centuries on a high-tech link to the Arthurian legend. I've got to be honest with you, right? Why? That's pretty I ugly. Mean, I agree. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, tourists. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Money it's very really touristy. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> After more than six centuries and a more a, a six, five million pound bill, a footbridge to the dramatic wind battered headland, at the heart of the Arthurian legend, will finally open to the public this weekend. I'm not going to read any more than that, but I just don't agree with well, that. I think it's ugly. It, it just doesn't make sense. Anyway, if there's no more questions, I will bid you all the goodbye, um, and then I will get my, my wares out, and you can have <laughs> the bag, right? And I will, I will say goodbye to everybody else. Yes. Um, whoever's doing the dishes, thank you very much. I know Alan is. Um, and I will see you next week. Good show, Carl. Jimmy, I love you, really. You're listening. I, 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 I didn't mean anything I said because I don't want you to be near me. I know. Oh, he could whip me with a big old stick. Save the beast for me. See you next week, Carl. Are you coming next week, darling? I will be there. Good. Yeah, I should say. You will be there. Yeah. Yes, ta guys. Bye. Bye. See you. Yes, one in the golf. Yeah. Bye. Take care, man. See you later. I might need it, in, yeah, just just in case, because 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 they, they 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 cherish Lantwick Major milk in Bridget. Really yeah, they I, I charge them mm -hmm. twice as much for the tea. Did you tell oh. them it comes from my house? No, because it would be less. Cheers, darling. Yeah. That comes that comes from Michelle's buttocks. That's what Michelle sits on. Because she's only small. So you've told us it. it's very small. Beautiful. Um, Dennis, I will see you next week. Then.
come tomorrow. Oh, shit, not with your husband. He'll be he, 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 I don't know yet. I'll bring your beast to the hands of husband. Got, no. Oh, the little woman's coming tomorrow as well. Nothing what I say in this room you're allowed to say to Michelle. I've got a friend coming tomorrow, so it depends what time.